Welcome to another edition of Spilling the Tea on GovCon. I'm Teresa Moon, Director of Business Development for Parabolus. We provide a better financial partnership for government contractors that includes a line of credit to fund your growth. The purpose of this podcast is to assist small businesses with success in the federal marketplace by introducing them to industry experts and resources that they may not otherwise know about. Today, my guest is Fernando Machado, CEO of CyberSec Investments, author of CMMC Simplified, The Beginner's Guide to CMMC, and our resident cyber guru. You may recognize Fernando from his many appearances on this show. His nationwide presence as a subject matter expert in cybersecurity and compliance and his countless recent public appearances. He's a great friend and an esteemed colleague. And as always, I'm super proud to have you on. Welcome, Fernando. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Of course. It's been a little while, so I'm glad that you uh, agreed to come back on. And we're excited yeah. to have you on the new platform. Um, Fernando, for those of you who aren't, aren't aware, he was my very first guest um, back many, many pun intended moons ago when we started this show. And so always grateful for you to be on and your expertise. And we got a lot to unpack today because a lot of stuff has been coming down the pike and people need to be aware of it, especially those that are engaging with the Department of Defense. So I'd say, you know, let's break it down in layman's terms the best that we can, which you're always great at. Um, and let's give the audience an understanding of what the current state of CMMC is and where we're heading in the nearest future. Um, so let's jump right into it. Cool? Yeah. Awesome. Yep. So as it stands today, what's the current status of CMMC and who does this affect and how? Yeah, so the CMMC rule was published on the December 26th uh, with a 60-day commenting period. So it went from December 26th all the way through February 26th for comments. And then on February 26th, that public commenting period closed. Uh, last year, uh, Dave McEwen, the deputy CIO, stated that the DOD was targeting fall of this year as the date that they want to start putting CMMC language into contracts. Now, the proposed rule has a four-phase rollout. So phase one will go into effect as soon as rulemaking is complete, and the DOD intends to include both CMMC Level 1 and CMMC Level 2 self-assessments. However, in that same paragraph under the phase one rollout, DOD at its discretion may require a CMMC level two certification assessment in place of a, D of a CMMC level two self-assessment. So I always tell folks, you know, put your contracting officer's hat on. What would give you a great assurance that your supply chain is in compliance, allowing them to perform a self-assessment or require the third party assessment? Uh, also, the phase rollout does not apply to the subcontractors. In other words, once CMMC becomes final, there's nothing stopping the prime contractors from saying CMMC is out, go get certified. So, which is super important, right? Because we always say you got to walk or crawl before you walk, right? And, and part of that process in GovCon is being a subcontractor prior to trying to go after prime contracts. And this is like super impactful to a degree that I think a lot of people aren't aware of, because if your prime comes to you and says, hey, regardless of your past performance with us, we're no longer going to give you the opportunities that we've given you in the past, because there's other people that are coming to us that can participate at the same level, but they're compliant. Yeah. Uh, to, to touch on that, Teresa, too, on like on who is affecting and how. So if you are handling federal contract information, then you'll have to meet the level one self-assessment requirements. But if you're handling controlled unclassified information, more than likely you're going to have to get a third party assessment in order to handle, uh, in order to continue to keep receiving contracts and bid on future contracts. I mean, I, I also see this as being an issue and we'll talk about it a little bit more in detail in a little while, but you and I talk all the time about how people tend not to move until they're affected, right? They they hear it, they know that it's there, they know that it's coming down, but until it affects their way of doing business, it doesn't really make the impression on them that it should prior to. And so that's why we're having this conversation. It It is a reality that is already here. We may have been talking about it for a long time. I know this is how you and I met, is right. you, you know my coming to you to gain information on this expertise of yours. 
And now it is here. It isn't looming anymore. It's here. Like you said, the comment period is already over. So if you had any grievances that you wanted to make the government aware of, that time has passed for you to have shared those. And you and I, in preparation for this conversation, talked a bit about some of those grievances that were shared and some of which we'll get into in some of my, my questions down the line. But you know, the next one that I want to dive into with you has to do with recourse, with being compliant or not compliant as it stands now. So what should all DOD contractors, sub and prime alike, be aware of as it pertains to current status of compliance? And that's with NIST 800-171 and CMMC because they, they're, they're not interchangeable, right? One has been around for a long time and you should have already done certain things. So let's talk a little bit about what they should be aware of with regard to that compliance issue. And then do you see it being imminent that people will be able to engage maybe for now, but will miss out on opportunities of contract awards in the future at, you know, as a recourse for not being compliant? Right. So uh, what they should be aware of is that CMMC is not a new set of requirements. You know, it's not a new set of controls. It's nothing like that. All CMMC is, it is the third party validation of existing requirements. So for example, if you currently have the DFARS 252.204-7012 clause in your contract and you're handling controlled unclassified information, then all CMMC is going to do is going to require a third party to come in and validate that you have met those DFAR 7012 requirements, particularly NIST 800-171 implementation. Uh, another thing that they need to be aware of is uh, kind of touching to your point a little bit earlier on some of the comments and responses in the CMMC proposed rule, the DOD basically preempted some of the most common comments and responded to all of them. And one of them was on the impact of cost to small businesses. And DOD said that the costs attributed to this rule do not include costs associated with existing requirements under the FAR 52.204-21 clause, which is for the basic safeguarding information of federal contract information, or the DFARS 252.204-7012 clause and the implementation of NIST 800-171. And the rule further goes to state that contractors that have those clauses should have already incurred those costs. So the, in the DOD's mind, the only thing a contractor is supposed to pay for is the cost of an assessment. So, I mean, that's huge right there too. And I think a lot of people get caught up in making sure that their proficiencies and their capabilities are at par with whatever the mission is. But if you're not compliant to receive the information of the mission and you're not compliant with whatever the details within it, whether you understand DFARS or not, it's already in writing. And so from a legal action standpoint, all they have to do is copy and paste from their documents that already has all this information lined out for them. And I think here's where an issue that I see happening comes into play because there is a lot on the business owner. The onus is on them to attest to the fact, similarly, like in my industry, where you know a bank will ask for a personal guarantee from the business owner for the, the lending uh, relationship, right? So it's a, a handshake, if you will, that at the end of the day, if you don't hold up your end of the legal bargain, you as the business owner are responsible for it, compliance or non-compliance, either way that it goes. And so if this isn't something of your expertise and you don't have someone internally working for you with this level of knowledge to say, yes, we are compliant to the level the government expects us to be in order to participate to this. I mean, this could be a really huge problem. We could, we could potentially be losing people who are already currently doing work for the federal government because they're, they're not compliant or they didn't follow the process properly in order to get compliant in time to keep working on their contracts. Yeah. And, and I know that the way that the CMMC rule, the proposed rule is written is that they're going to require an annual affirmation of a senior company official. Now they haven't stated what that senior company official will be, but in previous webinars, the DOD has stated is probably going to be somebody at the C level executive or higher. Mm -hmm. And 
they're going to be required to put their name, their contact information, and then add in at um, affirmation language. And they're attesting that they're not only meeting compliance, but they're also going to continue to keep meeting compliance throughout their uh, journey. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in terms of recourse, right? Um, people are already actively working on contracts that they're, you know, receiving QE, right? And they may or may not be compliant to the level that they need to be in order to have that information. Um, we've seen it in the past with different stipulations where um, audits have happened. And because of those audits, people have been fined to a significant level even. And until things like that start to happen, until we have our scapegoat, that first person that gets stripped of a contract, or that first person who is highlighted publicly for not uh, being brought in again as a subcontractor or being um, being able to be the prime on something once again because of non-compliance. What, what level do you see them going at? Because there are still a lot of skeptics about this, that they yeah. say, eh, is the DOD really going to be able to go through and make sure that everyone's compliant to the extent of even a subcontractor being stripped of their, of their subcontract? Um, you know, so I guess that's a two part question. Will the prime yeah. contractor be responsible for stripping their subs from it? And, and then will they suffer recourse as well as the prime for having a sub that wasn't compliant working on one of their contracts? Yeah. So I think that at the end of the day, the prime contractor is going to be responsible to ensure that their supply chain is in check. Uh, and then to, to go back to what you were saying earlier about uh, recourse, uh, there's been already a couple of instances where the government has come after contractors, both large and small, and settled with them through what's called the False Claims Act. Uh, so back in, I believe, uh, in 2021, the Department of Justice announced their new civil, uh, their their new civil cyber fraud initiative, in which that if companies were misrepresenting their cybersecurity compliance, they were going to go after them. Uh, most notable names, you've had Aerojet Rocketdyne that had to settle, I think it was $9 million uh, for misrepresenting their cybersecurity. Uh, and currently we're seeing some active cases right now. Uh, Penn State is at the center of a false claims act, as well as Georgia Tech is another uh, company that is currently going through the false claims act uh, litigation process. I mean, how does, a, how does a big organization like the three of those not have a stamp of approval from from an internal perspective to make sure that they're not getting whacked publicly like this. I mean, from a reputation standpoint, that's bad. Past performance is king in this industry, right? And if you right. get, you know, whether it is justifiable or not, if you get labeled as someone who is essentially lying about your status, and something as important as this, because a lot of this, I mean, with colleges and universities, that's probably personal and private information that they're not protecting properly without being cyber compliant. Um, you know, on the other side, DOD contractors, it could be potentially harmful information that could be stolen by, you know, enemies of our of our state. So, yeah. I mean, what what's the breakdown? Is it just people are just waiting until they get, you know, smacked on the hand for it before they do it? I mean, I, I really don't understand why people aren't taking it more seriously than they should, because this isn't anything new. Right. And I think the the reason why is because they have seen CMMC take so long to go through the process that they actually believe that it's going away. Uh, what they don't understand is from CMMC 1.0 to 2.0, uh, there was um, a period there of uh, several years in which the DOD was going back and actually going through, dotting all the I's, crossing all the T's, and getting all of the language and all of the information into that rule. And it finally got sent over to the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, which then led to the publication of the proposed rule in the Federal Register on December 26, which opens up that 60-day commenting period. So all of, everything that everybody has been waiting for is just the DOD making sure that they've dotted all their I's and crossed all their T's. It's not that the program is going away. This was actually directed by Congress uh, of the National Defense Authorization Act fiscal year 2020, which stood everything up from that time period going forward. So 
like make no mistake about it. I think this is going to come down. It's going to come down hard. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that I also uh, jokingly say uh, in my book is that when it comes to CMMC, I, I always notice contractors go through what we like to call the five stages of grief. Uh, there's a lot of denial. Um, you know, you know, uh, you know, I'm a small business. I'm a woman owned small business. I'm a veteran owned small business. Um, then we get into, um, anger, you know, why is the DOD doing this now? I've been in business for, you know, 50 years and then eventually, right. We come around to acceptance and it's either going to be contractors are going to choose to accept to do business with the government, or they're just going to say, you know what, this is the cost benefit is just not here for me and we're out. Right. I mean, it's all true. And, and shameless plug, here's the book, CMMC <laughs> Simplified. I have it on my desk because I haven't gotten you to sign this for me yet. And I need you to. Folks, yeah. he literally wrote the book on it. You can get it on Amazon. I'm going to share out the link for that because I think, look, it isn't, you're not getting a novel here, right? He breaks it down as simplistically as possible. So you, as a small business owner, will be able to read through it and digest it and understand it. But I think the most important part here is that you're not hiding from the fact that this is a complex and complicated subject that has been rolled out slowly and purposefully with the intent of not going away. It is DOD is essentially test piloting it for the rest of the federal government. Once it gets rolled out, all of the other agencies are going to are, are going to hop on board with it. Uh, civilian agencies combined. I see this as something you and I have talked about this for years now. This is going to be a private sector. Uh, issue very soon as well, because there's a lot of private sector businesses that support federal work, right? And so, um, and I think it's going to trickle down more into just outside of that whole, you know, classified information environment. It is just in general, having access to federal government details is going to require a certain level of, of secrecy or um, compliance, because we need to protect the things that are happening internally. Um, yep. you, you know, and I, and I just think it's, it's been too long. We've, we've let things get to an extent now where our private sector businesses are, in, are being infiltrated, you know, as we speak, we're talking right now, and there are businesses that are being completely demolished and overtaken by cybersecurity risk and threats. Yeah. And, and, and it's a huge problem. And for it to permeate into the federal work the way that it does is scary because this affects the entire world. You know, the federal government is the largest buyer of goods and services of anything in the entire world. And so if we could be brought down by a, a cyber attack, uh, you know, th this is something that we all should be taking part in and being proud to be a part of pushing it all through. And so I'm super grateful for you to always be willing to chat about this. You know, you have a full-time job and you, you work the circuit going to these events to let people know this is a real thing. And, and I think in terms of that honest and thoughtful, delivery of information. Let this be known that I, I have vetted this situation a lot. And Fernando is a trusted advisor for Parabolus and for a lot of the, the DOD and other agency partners that, that I work with. I always share him as a valuable resource for this information. And you've never let me down in terms of not only are you staying up to date with everything since day one. I mean, you, you've been involved with it since it was rolled out in 2020 but you're making sure that you're on the front line of newer information coming out so that people are always getting those proper updates. You're involved in it from an advocacy standpoint of how people can protect themselves. This is not fear mongering. This is what can we do to make sure that we're all doing the right thing from a cyber standpoint so that we're protecting ourselves and our, our country's interests. And so I think it's, it's important for me to get on a diatribe about that. And so and Fernando did not pay me. <laughs> Just so everyone's clear, I'm I'm coming from my own free will to give you that that type of endorsement. So, and I mean it wholeheartedly. Um, let's move into our next question because I think that this is something that everyone's going to be asking about. Why haven't we talked about it yet? So, typical timelines for level one and level two implementation, and then the audit process too. And you know, you don't have to divulge your your internal secrets, but fees, typical fees that can be incurred both from implementation and implementation and remediation and audit. Yep. So, uh, when it comes to timelines for implementation, uh, it typically varies. So we typically tell people that if they've done absolutely nothing at all from start to finish, depending on how aggressive you want to be, 
it can take anywhere between eight to 12 months is the average time that I've seen an industry to get ready. Um, and people are probably wondering, well, why does it take so long? Well, there's typically policies, procedures, um, you know, work papers, uh, work instructions uh, that have to be written out. And as well as like the implementation of the technology. So there's going to be the purchasing of compliant products and services. Uh, you know, spoiler alert, if you are going to be processing, storing, or transmitting CUI using Microsoft 365 commercial, you would be deemed non-compliant per your DFAR 7012 clause. Uh, and so all of these different things, right? Those are that's typically the timeline for implementation. Now, when it comes to the actual audit process, that can take uh, what I typically tell folks about three weeks. So you're going to have about a week of, you know, you're going to go through your scoping call to determine the scope of your environment. Um, the assessor is going to require you to provide them with your policies, your procedures, any type of artifacts, uh, most importantly, your system security plan, which is a requirement per DFAR 7012. Uh, then comes the week of your assessment. It's typically uh, Monday through Thursday. Friday is left there as kind of like a reserve day for any go backs or potentially an on site visit, depending on how your environment is set up. And then there's about, we always allot ourselves about a week post assessment to write everything up and provide our recommendations. And so, what I've heard from this is if they started today with implementation, they're not going to be ready for that fall start. That's exactly right. Yep. So, uh, you're already like said, behind the eight ball you're already behind because in the DOD's mind, right? You've already had these requirements in your contractual agreements. And, you know, unfortunately the dirty little secret in the defense industrial base is that everyone has been attesting that they've been meeting 800-171, but no one's actually been doing it. Right. Well, I mean, that that's going to be the, the telltale sign um, once they start really checking up on that. So, so let's say, they, they were accurately saying that they're compliant based off of past regulations that were already in place, right? And they need to go through the audit process. What's an industry standard for an audit um, in terms of rates? So we have seen um, some C3PAOs out there state that they will start at 32,500. Uh, there's other C3PAOs that have a flat rate of 50,000. Uh, another one starts at 53,000 and then the numbers just go up from there. And what really drives the cost is going to be the size and complexity of both the organization and the C3PAO potentially assessing you and availability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you come to me today wanting an assessment, my rates are going to be significantly lower than if you come to me and saying, I need to get, get assessed today and I already have three months, I'm already booked out for three months. And so now I have to move you around. And unfortunately, there's going to be premiums with that. And I think the impact that you and I discussed in prepping for this conversation, how many uh, certified uh, 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 assessors are there right now to this day nationwide? Uh, so when it comes to assessors, uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and go. Um, I'm going to go back the other way. I'm going to say how many C3PAOs they are. Uh, C3PAOs, the, the CMMC third-party assessment organizations, there's about 50 of them. But as far as actual assessors, there's 186 per the CyberAB's website. But you have to understand that some of these assessors are either already tied to some C3PAOs or they're only doing specific work as uh, certified CMMC instructors. And so maybe they don't want to do assessments, but one of the prerequisites to be an instructor is to be an assessor. So that 186 is probably a little bit lower, probably looking at maybe 140, 150. So I, no matter how you look at it, even if you were to double those numbers overnight, it's still not enough to take on the entire defense industrial base. So the longer folks wait, the more expensive and the more convoluted it's going to get. Do you know, have a rough est rough estimate of how many businesses are participating in the div currently? So there's so many numbers thrown around. Um, in the latest CMMC rule, they they estimate about eighty thousand. Uh, in the previous CMMC rule, they said there was about three hundred thousand contractors. So I don't think the DoD actually knows how right. many contractors there are because 
from from a flow down perspective, the DOD knows who the prime is because they give them the contract directly and who the first tier sub, but the DOD doesn't know who sub number two, three, four, five, or six because of contract privity. So mm -hmm. I don't think the DOD is ever going to know how many people are in the defense industrial base, uh, but this is one way that they're going to be able to enforce compliance and ensure that their data is protected. I think it's pretty safe to say, though, even if you take a third of the lowest possible participation number, that's still a whole lot of businesses that will need to be assessed and certified by a very, very few number of people that are qualified and capable of doing so. So yeah, you're agreed. You're in a tight spot right now as it pertains to that. And I think a lot that we spoke of in our our preparation for this as well talked about fees are going to be determined based off of expediency, right? It's like if you need something to be delivered overnight, you're going to pay a heck of a lot more than if you're okay with standard delivery. Um, yep. So the faster you need it and the more important it is that you get it faster, the more it's going to cost you. And so if you're worried about how much this is going to cost your business to get compliant, these are things that you need to be taking into account for today. Because we've already said, eight to 10 months in implementation, you're already behind it. So if you haven't done any of that, realistically, you are not only going to have to do all of those things to get compliant, but then have someone come in and certify that all of that is accurate and up to up to code for what CMMC standards are. So, I mean, no. th this is this is great information. And this is not to scare people. This is just to be open and honest about it, right? Can't hide behind the veil of it anymore. It's here. There are people who can help you. And Fernando's a great representation of that. Um, and so I think, you know, this is just part one. We need to have you back. You've got some partners that you work with internally within your portion of the industry as well that we'd love to bring in and, and, and expand this conversation because it's so important. It's going to affect so many businesses. And if we can help be a catalyst for good in terms of making you informed at a level that will be helpful, then that's what this show is all about. Is It was really yeah. connecting you with that information and the people who can help you process that information properly. And so um, really appreciate your, your time and your information today. Um, I always like to end the show with asking, you know, for a pro tip, any words of advice or words of wisdom that you can share with the audience that doesn't necessarily have to be CMMC driven, but of course we welcome it because you're the expert. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I would always say, um, if you're, if you're trying to determine if you have to do CMMC or not, uh, just look into your contracts, make sure that you one have those uh, clauses in there, such as that DFARS 252.204-7012 clause. And if you're actively handling controlled unclassified information. And so those are kind of like the two starting points that I would say that you should go take a look at. And that's going to paint a clearer picture on if this is something that you're going to have to do or not. Well, as always, very much appreciate your information. Thank you for your, your tips for our listeners. We're going to have you back very soon so we can keep expanding this conversation so we can continue to help. And uh, I appreciate you very much, my friend. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And thank you all for joining us. As always, we pride ourselves on sharing the most insightful and exciting people and information to help you better navigate your GovCon journey. If you like what you heard today, you can see all of our past podcasts, which are archived on our YouTube channel by the same name. Stay tuned for all of our future guests in the coming months as we help you grow to great heights in the year ahead. I'm Teresa Moon, and this is Spilling the Tea on GovCon. Have a great day, my friends. Yeah.